Hello, everybody, who braved the rains. What is that? Yeah, just let me know when it gets close to 7.30 so we can let people who are going over to see Ethan. Well, I'm excited to share something with you guys that the Lord put on my heart. Good to see you. Hi, Linda. Good to see you here. The Lord put on my heart uh, last Monday. And Holy Spirit, you know, this Holy Spirit series has been really cool. One thing I've learned over the past five years or so, walking in the freedom ministry and the freedom ideas uh, is that the Holy Spirit always calls me upwards. He always calls my heart to a place that's more than I can even see myself in. You know what I mean? It's always the upward call of God in Christ. The Holy Spirit's always drawing me that way. And last Monday, uh, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to read First Peter. So that morning, uh, I read First Peter. And and so Tuesday morning, I just thought, you know what, I'll just keep right on going. So I read Second Peter and, or started reading Second Peter, and that's when I discovered uh, some amazing things the Lord wanted to show me. And tonight, this is going to be really rough, but it's, it's good Holy Spirit teaching you rough teaching. You know what I mean? I haven't fine-tuned it. But if I could just throw the seeds out and let the Holy Spirit fine tune it in you and continue to fine tune it in me, that's good. Because if you have your own personal walk with Jesus, you're spending time with him, then let some of the things that he's spoken to me tonight as I say it, just let it simmer. Because I can guarantee uh, it's going to be good. We're going to be in Second Peter chapter 1. And... <clears throat> If I was going to title this, it's a title that Eric and I, we were sitting talking about this because it started last Monday and then Tuesday I read it and all of a sudden, you know how it is when the lights come on and just this new level of the Lord calling you higher and higher like I mentioned and we were talking about it and we were like, oh my goodness, this is so awesome and, and Erica goes, that's like the excellent life and I went, oh, yes, that's my book title. That's the sermon message. That's, that's the whole new vision for the year for me. It's called the excellent life. The excellent life. And I was like, man, that is so good because you'll see that excellent is, is in this passage that we're going to read about. And so, um, you know, the, trying to find the meaning for life is humanity's big question. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose? We would say, yeah, we got a pretty good handle on it and growing in that. But really, that is the world's issue. What is the purpose? What is the meaning of life? And I'm telling you, we've been called to the excellent life. And that's going to make more sense as we look more at this scripture. Uh, so what is the meaning of life? What is the answer? I'm telling you, the answer is arete. That's a Greek word, R-E. A-R-E-T-E, -E, arete. Now, arete, you know what we ought to do first? Hey, uh, throw up Second Peter chapter 1. Let's, let's read first. Uh, I had three pages of notes, and I thought, Lord, I only had like 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm about to like go to, like, I'm about to skip. So Second Peter chapter 1, there's just no way. I'm just going to have to get the gold nugget out of this thing and just throw it out. Uh, let me find it. I didn't, I don't have my glasses. Sorry, you guys. I was already prepared. Chris called me this morning. Hey, you want to speak tonight? Sure. I'm good, baby. I'm good, baby. I'm good. The word of the Lord is, is always good. I got, there they are right there. Awesome. I'm glad the Wednesday night crowd can just flow, go with the flow. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I love that. He's a servant and an apostle. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Isn't that amazing? Here is Peter. 
This is the guy who walked on water, the guy who said Jesus. This, this is the guy who, you know, Jesus rebuked. This is the guy who, who denied Jesus, the guy that was the most vocal. And here he's, he's writing this letter to believers, those who, uh, who have obtained a faith like mine, he's saying. I think it's amazing that we can have a faith like Peter. He's a servant and an apostle, and we can walk in a faith like his. Wow. Of equal standing. That means the equal standing means it's of same value, same worth than his, as his, with ours. How do you get faith? By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I can't talk about that because there's way too much, and it's so good talking about the righteousness of God. Verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace. Grace is the power of God to transform a person's life. It's not permission to live the way you want. Grace is God's power to change you. And the peace of God is something that, that gives you rest in the midst of whatever happens in life. Chris was talking about freedom. You know what freedom is? Resting in his peace. When all the storms of life are raging and everything seems out of control, you could be at peace in the middle of it. That's a good place to be. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. So the more you know Jesus, the more grace and peace is going to be added to your life. The more time you spend with him, the more you get to know him personally, the more, I love that word knowledge because here's what it means. It's, it's epigenosco or epinosis. It, it, it's, you know, there was a time, and you guys will understand, there was a time when I first met Erica where we would talk on the phone or I would write a letter and I was getting to know her. Y'all remember that time where you just get to know someone, it's a verbal communication, it's what do you like, and you like this, and I like that, and I like to go there, and I'd like to do this with life, and blah, blah, blah. And, and there's this time where you're getting to know one another, but then there comes that moment, that's what this word is, that moment where we said I do, and we really got to know one another. Nothing held back. We got to know. It's when two become one and you can reproduce after that. This is what this knowledge means. It's when you and Jesus become one and what is produced in you is something like him. That needs to be something happening in our lives daily. Even if we don't get something birthed out of that, at least you're trying to give birth. <laughs> You've heard of new couples trying to get a baby? Hey, let's, let's try. That's what, that's what this no means. We're trying to get pregnant. And so we're spending time with him and getting to know him. And what happens is when you get to know him, there is a release of grace and peace from him into me that changes me. It settles me. It gives me purpose. It gives me meaning. That's a good thing. So grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of uh, Jesus our Lord. Now verse three. <clears throat> wow. His divine power, his divine power has granted, get the words, God is power and he has granted to you, here's permission, he has granted to us all things. Where is the limitation in all things? There is no limitation, okay? So his power is providing to me and to you everything, all things that pertain to life, Zoe, which is his life in me, which was lost in the fall, he gives back through Jesus Christ. So when we say yes to the righteousness that's found in Jesus, we get life. And there's no limitation on that life. And godliness. Godliness is the product of me believing something about him and 
his God likeness is formed in me and it changes the way I live. Did you hear that? Godliness is a constant growing process where life and who he is is formed in me because of the grace and the peace of God that was released. When I get to know him, it transforms me and it adds life and more life and more life. It comes bubbling up out of me, life abundantly. It keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. And I become look and I am looking more and more like him every day. Jesus said, a disciple is not greater than his teacher or a slave greater than his master. But what you can be is just like him. You hear what he's saying? And here this verse gives us no limits except the teacher himself. Are you hearing it? The high calling of God is that you and I live the way Jesus lived. His divine power, not my strength, not my ability, not my efforts, not my determination, has given me everything I need for life and godliness. Through the knowledge, there's that word again, knowledge, twice in two verses. The more I get to know him, the more he implants his seeds of life in me and godliness in me, and the product is I look like him. So I'm trying to get pregnant every day. Last Tuesday, he impregnated me with something, and I love it because it's good, and I want to see it continue to grow. He's called us to his own, I love this, Let's, I'm, this is where I'm going to jump off and go into what he's saying. His divine powers granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, that's Jesus, or the Father, who called us to his own. He has called us to his glory and his excellence. Now, I started by saying arete. The word there, there, there's two words. There's for glory and there's excellence. I'm talking fast because I don't have a lot of time. It's 7.07. Glory is doxa. Excellence is this word arete. Doxa is when the manifested glory of God happens in and through our lives. Jesus walked in the glory of the Father. He said, if you see me, you see the Father. He manifested the glory of God everywhere he went, okay? But he also manifested the arete of God, which, is, look, God is calling us up, man. I'm telling you, this is good. Arete is an ancient Greek word meaning excellence or virtue. Some of your Bibles, this uh, is the ESV, and it, it has excellence. Some versions say virtue, or has anybody got a different version that says anything other than excellence or virtue? Goodness, that, that's also a, a, an English. See, what's difficult is this is an ancient Greek word and they had a trouble trying to translate that Greek word into the English. And so excellence, goodness, or virtue is the closest they can get. But I'm telling you, it doesn't touch it. That's the weakness of the English language. It doesn't touch it. So arete is the highest quality state one can achieve. Now this is from the Greek mindset. So what the Greek mindset is trying to come up with a definition of pursuing the highest quality of life I can find. What is the greatest experience that I can have to give me life? Now let's think for a moment. This is the Greek mindset outside of understanding Jesus, understanding God. So the Greek is looking for the highest standard, the highest thing that I can find to give me life, to make life worth living. That's why I asked in the beginning, why life? What's the purpose of life? And God's called us to the excellent life. So arete is the quality of being the best. And we live in a world where people are trying to be the best they can be at whatever they're doing. 
We want to be the NBA champions. Just watch the NBA playoffs. Love watching basketball. And the Golden State Warriors won the championship. They achieved the highest goal in the NBA is to be the number one basketball team in professional sports. But there's a lot of people choosing a lot of different paths to try to be, to have or obtain highest quality of life. Maybe it's health. We want to eat and maintain our body. I'm not saying that anything I'm fixing to say is bad. I'm just saying pursuits for highest quality of life is what all of us will go after. And every one of them is different. There is political agendas. Think about the political pursuit to have the highest standard or quality of life for America. And everybody's got these different ideas, so they vote for the person that will, that will think to get the, per, the right ideas to match theirs. So we're all looking for the highest standard, highest quality of being for Americans. Maybe it's, it's with a career. If I could just be this career, then I will be doing something significant with my life. Or maybe if I had this economic plateau, if I could just achieve the million dollar standard or, or whatever standard that is, I will have achieved the highest quality. Or if I could just find and marry the right person, that love will bring to me the highest quality of life. You hear it could go on and on. I mean, it's endless the things that we will pursue to try to optimize life for us. And Jesus has called us to something much greater than the shallow of those things. Even though those things are great, we want to healthy, we want to succeed in careers. Is this thing falling off? I mean, we want to do those types of things. We want, and there's nothing wrong with that. But those are sub goals <laughs> compared to the excellent arete that God has called us to. Most pursue in my research in the past week. Uh, I found a really interesting thing and I want to throw it out. Most pursue arete one of two ways, and I've mentioned some already. Number one, happiness or love. I think that the, that the highest quality of life would be for me to be happy. Whether it's momentary happiness or I look, the long, I look at the long term of my life and I think when I reach this stage in life, I will be the most happy if I make this choice, this choice, this choice, and this choice, and it will lead to future happiness. You know what I mean? I go to college, I get a degree, I marry the right person, I got a career, I'm, I make the investments financially, I make all, and at the, at the certain time of my life, ah, highest state of arete I can find. I've arrived. Happiness. We all want happiness. We all want love. The second area by which people would pursue arete is in service. Giving myself to a greater cause than me. You know, we have careers where people serve other people. There's police officers who serve. There's military who serve. There are firemen who serve. There are all these different careers you can choose, like doctors, and you serve other people. And it makes you feel good to be able to help someone else. And we would think that that's a high quality of life if I'm giving myself to help someone else in their quality of life. That's awesome. But all that is still down here. As good as they are and as successful and moments of happiness and, mo and feelings of a success they can be, they're still down here compared to what he's trying to communicate to us. The Holy Spirit's telling us something. I've called you to a glory and an excellence that goes beyond anything that mankind can try to dream up yourself. It's something that God himself releases by grace and peace that transforms you and gives you true life and true godliness. The greatest example of arete is Jesus himself. Think about it. His life demonstrated to us the arete for mankind. That is amazing. 
Yet the disciples the entire time thought that, oh, well, well you and you are going to establish the kingdom and destroy, you know, get rid of the Romans and establish the throne of David. And he's like, look, that's not, and I'm using this word, arete, because that's, that's not what I'm about. I didn't come to, to defeat the Romans. I came to give you arete, life something that's going to happen on the inside. So arete can encompass one or both of the elements of happiness or service. Maybe those are mixed together in some sense. Maybe they're not. You're just pursuit of different things. I mean, a different one at one time or the other. Life lived without God to define the arete can lead to many types of pursuits. Sadly, we know that all those pursuits will leave you still in a vacuum. They will leave you empty. We talked about freedom. Chris is talking about freedom. Freedom is when you are able to experience the arete of God. True freedom is when I can rest in the grace and the peace of him and know that he's giving me life, he's giving me godliness, and he's transforming me, and he is giving me his glory and his excellence. Boy, this is powerful. Jesus was the arete of God. You and I are the arete of Jesus. Let that sink in. You and I, because of the power of the gospel, the power of God released in Jesus' life, when we say yes, then we receive the glory and the excellence and we become the arete of God just like Jesus was the rete of the Father when he walked the planet. Oh my goodness, that is amazing. That I can look all over this room and I see the excellent work of God. I see the glory of God. I see the excellence of God. I see the glory of God. And it has nothing to do with what we tried to pursue on our own. It's by saying yes to the one who said, this is my arete and I'm gonna take your funky, empty, dark life, I'm going to exchange it. You hear it? This is excellence, Jesus said. And for the joy set before me, the joy is I get to give you that freely. And all we have to do is say yes. And when he comes in, he transforms us, makes us a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old thing passed away, and I become the arete of God. Now, I might not look like on the outside. I just look like Darren. But I can tell you what's going on on the inside is the excellence and the glory of God. And it is bursting to want to get out. But scripture says that people are destroyed for a lack of understanding. Because we don't understand this transaction, this reconciliation that happens, we live beneath the high standard and the high quality that we've been called to. So we, we, we just settle. We settle for something less than what he's telling us right here. <laughs> As Dan Moeller likes to say, you have sold yourself cheap when you are bought at such a high price. Let that sink in. I sell myself to a less standard or quality of life when I was paid for and bought at this standard, at this price, so that I can live here but we settle for there because of a lack of understanding of what the gospel does to us. Because of a lack of getting into his presence 
and letting the word impregnate us in that relationship so that what happens is a birth of truth, a new birth of truth and continually growing in relationship with him and it comes alive and we begin to experience the arete of God. So I encourage you, don't sell cheap. And if you have, let's get your eyes refocused on the truth. Let me read it again. His divine power has granted to us all things. So there is no limitation. So why should we sell out? Why? Because we don't understand what this is saying. His divine power has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and his excellence by which, listen, verse four. I didn't think I had verse four yet, verse four. So understand, he's given us his glory. He's given us his excellence. And what's going to happen when we understand we're standing in a place of the manifested glory of God is in me, it can't help but get out of me. Trees produce fruit. Never underestimate. I love the power of Jesus' parables. An eye is the lamp of the body. When the eye is healthy, the body is filled with light. When I begin to see, oh my goodness, this this week, Eric and I were sitting there and we're going, I'm a manifestation of the glory of God. I'm a manifestation of the highest quality that God wants on the planet. I get to manifest that. I get to grow in understanding that. How often, though, have I sold out cheap to issues in life? I let the issues of life determine who I am. I let struggles in life determine who I am. I let worldly standards of what is excellent and what is good quality determine my pursuit of what is excellent and quality, and I live way short of what he's called me to because I, I'm blind. Years I live blinded to that high quality, to the high standard that I've been called to in Christ Jesus because I settled for just going to church, to just doing a devotion, to just making sure I pray, just make sure I tell someone Jesus loves them. I just fulfill the standards that this it's going to make me somehow Full, you know, make me, oh yeah, I've reached the standard. I did that this week, I did that this week, I did that and I did that. Yeah, I, I did the four. I did the list. And that's not what it's about at all. <laughs> that's not what it's about at all. He's called us to glory and excellence by which, verse four, he has granted to us, listen, the glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. You got a promise from God? I guarantee that promise is calling you to his glory and excellence. Whatever promises is made, it's elevating us to a place where we walk in the fullness of the glory and the excellence of God for you. But when we sell out cheap, and we let our eyes be distracted off of the power of the gospel. And what happens is we'll give in to the lower standard of quality than the one we were created to be and do. Well, that is good. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them. <laughs> Do you see what he's saying here? Because of those promises and the glory and excellence that's been deposited into us, that through these promises that you're my son, you're my daughter, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you're seated with me in heavenly places. I've taken you out of the dominion of darkness and into my marvelous light, into my kingdom. That's who we are. People of the king, promises. 
If I go away, I will send the Spirit. Did Jesus go away? He went away. So what did he promise to send? The Spirit. So is the Spirit here? Yes, he is here. Because he promised, if I go away, I will send the Spirit. So he's here. <laughs> he's here. That's a promise. That wasn't 2,000 years ago in Acts. It's today too. He's still away. So the Spirit is here. So that through them you may become partakers, partners in relationship with and have a divine nature. What? I can have a divine nature? That's what it says. This is the Word of God. Because He has chosen, because God is righteous, and He's chosen to display His righteousness in the gospel, which is the power of God. When we receive that, His grace and His peace makes happen through the promises, you and I become like God. Not God, we become like him, which is the original mandate in Genesis. If you go back and read it, I will create them. They will be in my image and in my likeness. They will display on the earth the glory of God and the arete of God everywhere they go. And he takes out of the man, a perfect man, and makes a perfect woman. He says, you two go and fill the earth with perfect, perfect kids. But they got a, they got a different idea. The enemy came and lied and made them sell cheap. You can do it on your own. Your own strength and your own knowledge and your own ability can, can attain a, sta or a standard that God is trying to keep you from. And that was such a lie. The world is filled with people trying to pursue a standard that's way beneath what they were created to be and to live. And it's a lie. Here he is saying that we can be a partaker of the divine nature, that we can achieve like our master, like our teacher, Arete. And that's not blasphemous. That's not arrogant. That's not haughty. That is who we were made to be. We need to think that way. I'm encouraging you. I'm calling you up. It's time for us to begin to think like sons and daughters. We are the glory and the arete of God. We are the excellence of God. We are the high standard that the world needs to say, whoa, look at how they're living. Look at how they love one another. Look at how they treat one another. Look how they take care of one another. Look how they do family. Look at how they do life. That's what we're looking for. But too many of us, unfortunately, we sell out cheap. But there's always hope. There's hope to get back in and get refocused and repent, which is change the way I think and go back to thinking that this is who I am, not what I was doing or living or thinking I was. We've become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, I love this last part, and we're gonna end with this. What time is it? 7.30 having escaped, this is Christians. Hey, you guys have escaped the corruption that is in the world by the sinful desire. You've escaped it. So you don't have to be a slave to it any longer. Only if you sell out to it because you don't understand the high calling. He says, if you believe what I'm telling you, this gospel, you have escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. The world is full of sin because of mankind trying to pursue and find life on his own. And they settle for an arete, for an excellence and a glory way less than they were designed to live and be. So two things as I finish. Number one, receive the arete and glory of God. You must be before you can give it. Be the glory of God. Know that's who you were made to be. Know that you are the highest expression. Of, well, well, look, but I keep, but I, I, stop. It's not about you any longer. It's about him. We were not made for ourselves. That's why he says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Because denying yourself doesn't give you permission to look at you and where you're not measuring up. 
Taking up your cross doesn't mean, means that the world's not gonna define who I am any longer. The world's not gonna tell me the high standard. Jesus is telling me the high standard because I'm following him. And when I follow him, I will look like him, the divine nature. It won't be religious. It won't be weird. It'll be authentic love for yourself and for other people because you see your value. You finally recognize that you are that treasure hidden in that field that Jesus is willing to pay everything so that you can be found and displayed for everyone to see. Yeah. That's a great place. Y'all stand with me. Father, you are amazing. This gospel is an amazing gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And this salvation calls us out of the pit of selfishness and self-centeredness and self-focus and self-advancement and self-exaltation and it calls us out of that and into a place of purpose that we were designed for. And I thank you, Father, that it is the grace of God that is given to the humble. And tonight, Father, we humble ourselves and understand this truth. You made me. You saved me. You transformed me. And you filled me with your glory and you filled me with your excellence. And you've placed upon my life this high calling that I know that, it, that it's your work in me that can bring about that. And I surrender to that work tonight. I surrender to you, Holy Spirit, to do what you want to do, to impregnate me each and every day as I walk with you, to impregnate me with a knowledge of you, that I would know you more every day, that I would begin to love you more every day and experience in you every day, it, no matter how I feel, no matter what's going on around me, the feelings and thoughts are lies. What's truth is I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That's the truth, I live by faith. And I pray that over every person in this room, that they see with eyes of faith, that their heart is enlightened, that they would begin to see more clearly who they were made to be. And that will transform them and, and they will begin to live a life and godliness that they never thought possible before. New places in you, new excellence, new glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, bless you. There's a meeting in the shed. <laughs>